Hi, I'm Tiffany. And I'm Rihanna, and welcome or welcome back to Fresh Off the Broke. Fresh Off the Broke is about personal experiences growing up Asian American in a predominantly white community, Asian media, and Asian pop culture in general. Race has always been a sensitive topic. Every day, there are debates over race. With our podcast, we intend to shed light on the experiences of first-generation Asian immigrants, not put them on a pedestal. We understand that race isn't everything, but there should be an acknowledgement of people of color, the knowledge gap, and the racial divide that will ideally be broken. Now that that's out of the way, let's get into the episode. Today's topic is Imperial Japan. So before we start off with the episode, uh, we wanted to give a little bit of a disclaimer since this is more of a historical and then very specifically focused episode and lens. So Mm -hmm. we want to say here that this episode and everything we talk about is not, excuse me, is not meant to bash and hate on and uh, what's the word, put Japan or Japanese people in a negative light or say that all Japanese people are bad, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And then we also want to give listeners slash viewers discretion, a little content warning, since this episode will mention rape, brutalization, war crimes, and generally very traumatic events. So Mm -hmm. if that is not something that you are comfortable with listening about, listening to, then Perhaps this episode is not for you, or maybe today is not the day that you want to listen to that. Mm-hmm. Um, also, just I, I'll bring this up later, but um, we are in no means trying to, you know, like say this is all the information. Um, we're not, we're doing a very, very brief overview. Um, by yeah, all, I mean, it like, takes people years to study. Yeah. Yeah. Um, So if anything, just use this episode as a starting point. Um, Maybe, you know, kind of learn about if you if you are unfamiliar with imperialist Japan, you know, um, getting familiar with it and just using this as a starting point. This is not an in-depth episode on, you know, every single historical thing that happened during this time. Um, Yes. So For those of you who are not familiar with Imperial Japan or imperialist period in Japan, um, it refers to the period of time where Japan used military power to expand their reign. Um, By military power, we do mean like military force. Um, This is in no means like a, like a, a good period of time for Japan which we'll get into. Um, You may be familiar with the rising sun flag. That is Japan's, that was Japan's flag um, during their imperialist period. Um, And we kind of, we wanted to make this episode because it's a very important part of history that really does need to be recognized. Um, A lot of people aren't too familiar with it. and just, again, we'll get into it, but there is not really a sense of account- accountability from Japan no. when it comes to um, acknowledging the things that happened during this time period. So, you know, we just kind of wanted to um, spread some more information for those who may not be familiar so they can do their own research, you know, looking at the horrors of Imperial Japan. Um, so hopefully one day Japan will take some form of accountability. Um, but again, this is mainly for you know spreading awareness because this is very important history that not a lot of people know about. To give a little background of this period of time of Imperial Japan. So it was a Japanese nation state 
it existed from the Meiji Restoration period in 19, or, sorry, 1868 until the enactment of the Re Reformed Constitution of Japan in 1947. So the time frame is from 1868 until 1947. So to very, very briefly go over some important events that happened during Imperial Japan, um, there was the first Sino-Japanese War. This is when Japan wanted control and influence over Korea while Korea was in the Joseon dynasty. Um, then it was the Russo-Japanese War. This was when there was conflict between Japan and Russia over Korean control, like control over Korea. Um, then there was the annexation of Korea. And if you are learning history within like the Korean curriculum, this period of time was known as time of Japan Japanese forced occupation in Korea. Um, I don't think that the curriculum in Japan teaches it that way they probably don't even teach about this in Japan, but Korea knows this time as time of Japanese forced occupation. Um, after these, these the Sino-Japanese War, the Russo-Japanese War, and the annexation of Korea was the Taisho area when Japan entered World War I. Um, then there was the Showa period and the rise of nationalism. So during this time, um, Japan was previously embracing democracy and Western forms of government. Um, then when the Great Depression hit in the 19, around the 1920s, Japan's silk industry collapsed. And due to the industry collapsing, many people were put into poverty. Uh, many people were starving, no jobs. Um, you know, typical Great Depression things. Um, and... Japan, Japanese nationalists blamed the Western styles of government that have pre that were previously embraced um, and decided that Japan really needed to expand its territory to take back its power, get back all the money, um, get out of this poverty state, essentially. So during the Showa period, there was this rise of nationalism. And as well, during this time, Japan conquered Northeast China. Um, after this was the Second Sino-Japanese War. Um, during this time was the Nanjing Massacre, which we will get into. After this was World War II. I'm sure most people are familiar with this. Um, and after the attack on Pearl Harbor, Japan had multiple conquests. Um, including attacks in British Hong Kong and British Malaysia, as well as the Philippines. And this all came to an end in 1947, when, when the Allied forces ordered Japan to abolish the Meiji Constitution, Constitution and enforce the 1947 Constitution of Japan. The impact of imperialist Japan is very much still felt to this day. Um, countries still have incredible tension with Japan, not because, you know, like they're still resenting Japan for the acts that happened. It's more just Japan. Well, sometimes, sometimes it is. It is, it is. But it's to add salt to the wound. Japan has not acknowledged any of this mm -hmm. or has acknowledged it in the most minuscule way possible. Mm -hmm. Um. Yeah. So, like to this day, talking to any sort of country, people from um a country that was impacted by Japan, there is still some form of resentment and negative feelings towards Japan. Yeah, for sure. I mean, in the what would you call it? the affected countries? There's a lot of effort put in to educate their own people mm -hmm. and students about the war crime and the, the horrors of what happened in the past. And even across what you would call the, the Asian diaspora over, over here and everywhere, <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot of resentment. Mm -hmm. 
among parents, grandparents, and people that either grew up during the time or in some way were affected, maybe, what, what would you call it? Like the after effects? Yeah, uh, yeah. Of the war or the wars. Because, for instance, and a lot of people might be able to relate to this, but my, my parents, especially my dad, had a lot of resentment towards Japan. He he really enjoys watching these Chinese movies or historical... Well, I think he has watched a documentary or two, but usually it's historical fiction or a dramatization of the the Japanese and uh, and China uh-huh. and the and the various war crimes that occurred uh-huh. between that 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 uh, the the Japanese did onto China. Uh-huh. It's, you could almost say that's the only genre he watches. He doesn't really watch <laughs> anything else. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, same with my dad, actually. I can directly relate to this. Um, mm-hmm. He, when I was growing up, when just when, when anything in Japan or any sort of trace of Japan shows up in the media or something, my dad will bring up um, how the Japanese treated the Philippines while they had power, mm-hmm. while, they, while they controlled the Philippines. It was for three years um but so much brutality so much so many war crimes that happened um we'll get into it but he's very vocal about like oh no one knows about this uh but the japanese like in the philippines there was so much history and now they don't talk about it because you know japan doesn't acknowledge it like so even that like just a lot of resentment um, and he was not directly affected by this. Like, he, he wasn't in the war or anything. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, like, I'm I'm sure that this is a very common thing. I feel like especially for dads, just because, you know, typical, like, dads into, like, war and army and stuff like that. You know what I mean? Yeah, I'm not really sure where that comes from. yeah. But it definitely exists. And you know what? Comment down below if you have a father who is also very outspoken about Japanese war crimes. I'm I'm sure there's you're gonna get because it's it's almost a trope or a, a cliche. Right? Yeah. Yeah. To add on to what we're saying about how no one really talks about the topic of imperialist Japan and the the horrors of the countless war crimes that occurred. One thing that really helped kind of erase and what would you what would you say brush over distract, distract. yeah yeah distract and just completely kind of shift the focus away Mm -hmm. was Japan's soft power strategy. So there's something called cool Japan. And by by cool, they mean cool. Like, oh, wow, that's so cool. And so this was a government-initiated, essentially a a rebranding strategy, almost as you would uh, a marketing, for marketing a company where Japan wanted to completely reinvent themselves and their and their image, their exterior, their look, and how they're perceived globally through pop culture. Mm-hmm. So anime, food, technology, fashion, makeup, just, just anything that would be consumer kind of like consumer related Mm -hmm. and 
according to the government site, there is a site on Cool Japan that's really good, which is a little disturbing because the way that it's worded and the way that it that it looks and everything, it seems like it's just a, a harmless business initiative because it says, oh, Cool Japan is an initiative to further strengthen the ties between Japan and other countries in such areas as economic, culture, and diplomacy. That sounds that sounds perfectly fine, right? That sounds, that sounds very okay. innocent. Like what what other country what country wouldn't want to strengthen their their ties with other countries yeah. for economic and very cultural very friendly. Mm-hmm. But no, that's not the the reality of it is that they and it's incredibly impressive in a in a scary way because somehow they were able to deter 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 everyone from everything they did by amping up anime food technology and everything in all directions and then somehow and then now everyone knows japan as this amazing ahead of their time yeah. play with with anime i mean pe- people love anime that's kind of a, a fact mm-hmm. it's incredibly popular when people think of japan they think of cute stuff they mm-hmm. think of plushy they think of crazy plushy. technology yeah yeah, yeah. They, they think of the what do you call it the bullet train yeah the robots Mm-hmm. And then the the amusement park, the the tourist destination. Every Japan is cool. Yeah, now. cool Japan works. People really do think of Japan as cool. Yeah. Um, it's it's very scary. Like I think this has especially worked in the West. Um, I think even though like you know places in. Asia who were directly affected well I think everyone was affected by imperialist Japan but people who were directly directly affected by imperialist Japan there's a little more of a sense of like I know what you did um oh for sure I I feel like everyone well not everyone but I feel like the people who carry that resentment that we were talking about kind of squint their eyes and then yeah um, not to say that Japan, like, you know, isn't a technological hub and, like, doesn't have cool pop culture. It definitely does. And, like, Japan is very much, a like, a vacation point that, you know, like, I would want to go to. A lot of people who are still aware of what Japan has done would want to go to. Um, like, again, not taking away from how interesting Japan may be with their pop culture and everything. Just their soft power moves of you know rebranding as cool japan really did work for distraction yeah it was very subtle i mean uh, subtle in the sense that you wouldn't no one knew or no one noticed that that was what they were doing Uh oh wow japan's so cool like hey like japan's doing this and that Uh uh-huh like, as you said, Japan, when you think of Japan now, you generally think, like, oh, cool, technologically advanced, um, like, crazy place to visit, super cool, instead of Japan, oh, like, the country that committed the most, like, like, people refer to imperialist Japan as, like, the Holocaust of Asia. Yes, I have heard that before. Yeah. It, it was awful like it awful is an understatement like this it's insane that people don't think of that when they think of japan now and it hasn't even been that long mm-hmm. it's been a very short amount of time since all of this happened so i have here pulled up some comments and observations made by takuya tamaki a lecturer in international relations at labro university Uh, commenting on imperialist Japan and soft power. And so he said that before World War II, imperial Japan presented itself as the quote-unquote liberator of Asia, 
the only modernized Asian state to have escaped Western uh, colonialism, which contained what he called the core elements of cool Japan, since Japan was essentially showing itself as neither Asian nor Western, but as an exotic hybrid of Western modernity and Asian tradition, which you can kind of still see and feel now. Uh-huh. Because people view Japan as this place that's so ahead of its time. And unfortunately, due to you know, like the Eurocentric views and colonialism, people think of the West as superior and as more modern and people and you think of non zero century and like not the West as more behind. Uh-huh. And, and we've talked about this in the past of how uh, for instance people people think that oh like Asians are weird for eating with their hands or whatever. Uh-huh. Savages. And and so Japan kind of became this as uh, Tamaki would say, uh, exotic hybrid of Western modernity and Asian tradition because you get it's it's a it's a very unique packaging of uh, uh-huh. what they are, uh-huh. and their their work in this whole like national branding got themselves the the nineteen forties Olympics, which was a a big a big move for them. Mm-hmm. But then the the games were uh, later abandoned due to expand expansionist offensive in Asia that had ramped up in the late nineteen thirties. Mm. Which is a little bit of an understatement. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just a little bit. I just wanted to bring up. Um, for those interested, there is a Japanese artist who f- focuses on um, kind of exposing the unfiltered reality of what Imperial Japan was like or what it could have been like if it continued Um I'm butchering his name, but his name is Suhiro Maruo. Um, I think if you might be familiar with him, you'll probably be familiar with his work called um, The Camellia Girl or Shoujo Subaki. Um, It's kind of disappointing to me because he he's painted as this, you know, sick freak who just... um, likes to draw like gore um like erotic gore is what people claim his genre is but in reality it like he has been very outspoken that his work he he purposefully makes things gruesome and shocking and everything because this is what imperialist japan was like um it displays the toxicity of you know the nationalism during this time and just like again the brutality that occurred um there's one piece of work that he came out with um that seems like nonsense but it is a depiction of what life might have been like if america came to japan um and did the same things that japan did to other countries so if you know America had this imperial imperial mindset and nationalist mindset and um, committed the war crimes that Japan did it, it's kind of like I'm, I'm sure a lot of people read that work being like oh what's wrong with this guy um, what a sick fantasy like showing all these uh, Americans coming to Japan and doing this but in reality he's just making a comment on you know like what actually happened just reversed roles in a sense um I'd highly recommend him and his work he is one of my favorite artists if not my favorite artist and there's actually quite a bit of scholarly like 
interpretation done on his work. Um, but yeah, highly, highly recommend Suhiro, Suhiro Maruo. Great. Yeah, just a Japanese artist showing the realities and not going with soft power and the cool Japan rebranding strategy. As we've been saying throughout this episode, even today, there are still countless horrific events hidden and left unrecognized by the Japanese government, as well as uh, a lack of documentation, a, I'm going to say alleged, but, you know, wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Yeah. A, an effort to destroy documentation. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's, it's incredibly upsetting and frustrating for the the affected countries and people that suffered from the, the her, horrific, horrendous war crimes mm-hmm. that Japan did onto the, the, everyone. Mm-hmm. So I I think I brought this up in a past episode before because I was telling a story about a petition, but an an example of a Japanese war crime that is not recognized is the Nanjing massacre, also known as the the rape of Nanjing, and it was a a mass murder of Chinese civilians in Nanjing, the the capital at the time of the Republic of China. And the, I I don't know even really how to describe what happened there. It was it was just intense brutalization. I mean, there's a reason why they call it the the rape of Nan, Nanjing. Is yeah, it was there was mass rape, looting, killing. It 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 was just I it, inten- I don't even know if intense is, is the word to to use. Mm. But they they say that up to three hundred thousand or or more people died as a result. Mm. And. Going back to what I was saying about the petition, I I once, when I was grocery shopping at this Chinese plaza, that there was a an organization, uh, a group of some sort, that was asking for support for this petition to get the Nanjing massacre recognized. I think it was by the the not the Chinese government, by the Canadian, the, excuse me, the Canadian government. Hmm. And and my dad was really passionate about it when mm-hmm. he saw that they were they were doing that and he he signed it of course and he got me to sign it. Mm-hmm. At the time, I don't really remember how old I was, but I I didn't really understand what was going on uh, uh-huh. that day. I I didn't really at the time. I kind of just followed. Sorry. Yeah. yeah, I just followed what my dad said. He said, like, oh, the Japanese did this really bad thing. And I don't I don't mean that in a... I, I really don't mean that in a dismissive sense. At, at the time, this was how it was communicated to me. Yeah. And I was like, oh, that, that's awful. Um, yeah, I'll sign it. Mm. And I mean, after learning more about what happened i mean it's just just horrific and atrocious and i mean it's not it's not the first of its kind Mm -hmm. it's one of several that had happened Uh, yeah in in china and then in in other countries as well Mm -hmm. i mean actually um for this specific massacre there was a complete lack of documentation up until recent 
Um, I think some people may have been familiar with this if this is the type of content you see on TikTok. But there was a guy who um, he he has a popular TikTok account. He owns a pawn shop, and someone had come in with a book, um, kind of like I would say like scrapbook style, more of like mm-hmm. someone who was clearly you know participating in um, a war, like who was doing documentation themselves and writing little captions. Um, and putting them in like a a book just to you know like document things um and it was confirmed that this book had contained like a ton of images of the Nanjing massacre which was like an incredible not breakthrough but like an incredible incredible piece of evidence because you know there was a lot of effort taken to hide certain things that imperialist japan had done so this this video like blew up on tiktok and um i'm not sure exactly where this book ended up i know that the guy did end up contacting like i think a couple museums and he was talking to um I don't know some like government officials I believe um but yeah very very interesting to see how it kind of just popped up out of nowhere um but people are very happy that this came out because you know there's finally concrete evidence and pictures of this massacre occurring mhm the is actually quite an interesting that moment on the internet was quite interesting it went it went viral beyond uh tick tiktok i mean i saw i saw a news article about it yeah that was how i found out and then later on it just became a huge debate because there were historians disputing there there were people saying that it couldn't it's not real uh-huh. uh and he had and he had faced backlash for posting before authenticating mm-hmm. and so on and so forth and i mean i guess we we don't know yeah if it's real or not because I I'm I looked up this event. Well, not event. I mean, uh, I I looked up what happened with the the pawn, the pawn shop owner, or the pawn huh. man, and the book. And it seems and it seems it kind of ended on a question mark. Mm, it's unfortunate Mm -hmm. and it also it also says that the uh, authorities from the Nanjing Massacre Memorial have tried to contact him I don't know if anything happened after that it doesn't seem like there are a whole lot of what's the word coverage updates well yeah yeah, uh, updates I can't see, I mean, I'm checking right now and I can't really see where, where that story went. Mm-hmm. It's very upsetting. Like if this was real and could be authenticated, like this would be great for people affected, the country affected. Uh-huh. And forgive me if I found for lack of better words, dumb, because I'm not a historian, but, you know, like, for, for people to just, it's not real, you're a liar. Yeah. Because cause I can understand where some, some of these people might be coming from, since they are more informed on documentation, 
but when when it comes to because it's, it's already a, a track record of not documenting huh. and then for that to go down the way it did and i mean the poster the 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 pawnbroker is the man yeah who discovered it i mean of course he's not a he's not a famous well, not, i don't know why i said famous he, he's not some world-class historian it was he was shocked and in the moment made a made a post and i mean the the images that he saw in the album he said most were too disturbing to, to even really show on camera uh, oh yeah no to, it was like on, full on, on images TikTok. of what was happening like mm -hmm. which i understand people's skepticism when you know he's making a multiple part series on this um and you know not really like being like hey i'm posting these images somewhere but at the same time like if this is real he shouldn't be posting the images um and yeah well just... yeah I, I, his concern was be, being uh, it being taken down for being too gruesome yeah Yeah, I wish there were more updates on what happened with all of that. I don't really see anything right now. I just I looked it up because I wanted to make sure I wasn't remembering wrong. Mm -hmm. It seems well. It's in some places it says that it's been debunked. Hmm. And then, so, mm, I don't know, I'm a little confused. Again, it would be so, great if this was real and, you know, there was some way to authenticate this, but, mm -hmm. of course. Okay, so it says, so... There's an extract article from September 22nd, 2022, and no updates have really been made since. I I do think it's a it's a little much to witch hunt and kind of try and criminalize this person. Yeah, because he wasn't. It wasn't like he made a fake book and everything. It's just someone gave it to him and then he saw he opened it saw it was yeah was horrified and wanted to talk because people people talk about anything on social media yeah so yeah he it says that he wrote in an email to next Star that he was in the process of donating the book to China and mm. so that probably may have happened. Hmm. Let's see. Interesting. I mean, yeah, like, yeah, it says, and it says a lot of Twitter users were quick to to notice some things that may have been off about the the journal. Mm. or the the TikTok not TikTok Twitter users that were you know bashing him. Mm -hmm. but, you know, regardless, there will be Twitter users bashing anybody. So mm -hmm. yeah, I wish there was a better end. Well, I, I, yeah, I wish there was a clearer and better. I want closure. Yeah, like maybe there is a process that people are still waiting to authenticate it and, you know, like publicly release if they do publicly release. Like, I'm sure if this was real, then Japan would have like some sort of retaliation to the release of this. But although they could just ignore it, too. They could. Yeah. 
really don't know. That, that's yeah. I had to say. Some closure would be nice. Kind of sucks. But yeah, I mean, there are a lot of other examples of um, war crimes that Japan has committed. Um, it's an exhaustive list. Um, there was, there is um, one in the Philippines. I don't know if it's technically, well, what happened, you know, the war crimes, but it was referred to as the Bataan Death March, where um, when Japan was ruling over the Philippines for a period of three years, um, they would, there was a specific death march where they got all of the Filipino, like, soldiers and just people, you know, like, living there. Um, got them all like you know essentially just line up um, took all of their belongings raped the women um, and just killed all the men essentially Um, it was Japan was or the Japanese soldiers were notorious for essentially just forcing all of the Filipino women to become sex workers or not even sex workers they weren't getting paid um just you know just rape and murdering all the men but this specific death march was like an organized like we're gonna line everyone up have them walk to a certain area and just kill everybody um again there are just so many more examples pretty similar to the massacre and the death march that we um talked about but there's too many to go through and you would assume that people this would be you know not common knowledge but something that would be talked about but again Japan has done a very good job of distracting people um pushing the narrative towards you know like modern Japan not the history um of course there are people within the countries that are affected who will never forget um and do educate um the next generations on the history um but it's difficult when there's no acknowledgement um no nothing it's 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 difficult i don't know so to sum up this episode and our intent we wanted to spread awareness start a conversation about imperialist japan and the ongoing after effect and impact of what happened throughout those decades Mm -hmm. Because, well, I mean, look at soft power. I honestly, for a long time, I didn't even know what happened. Mm-hmm. And I also thought of Japan as just this cool place. And that, not that it's not cool, as yeah. we, it's not, that's not to say that. Japan is a hellhole or something. Yeah. the The purpose is to acknowledge the past, because I mean, they don't don't they say if we don't learn from history, we're only bound to repeat it. Mm-hmm. Hopefully, for the people listening, maybe you learned something. Uh, maybe you were aware of Japan and imperialist Japan, but you know learned. A little more about the history and the strategies that Japan has used to um, distract from that. Um, again, yeah, like Tiffany was saying, we just want to kind of spread awareness. There's not a lot of education in the West on this topic of imperialist Japan and it's very clear that soft power has been so successful in the West. So, you know, wanted to 
show the historical side of things. Hope you guys learned something. So Rihanna kind of started doing this when she was talking about the the artist, but if you are interested in the topic, like we're saying, this episode is by no means a scholarly resource. Yeah, no. <laughs> we highly encourage you to maybe look into books and other educational resources for more information. I mean, if there could potentially be I don't know, I guess maybe if you're a university student, you could look into Asian studies courses or any type of resource. And I I don't know, I can't think of another word other than resource right now. Uh -huh. But you could probably get some information from an Asian studies department or Asian studies institute or an organization and I mean the the internet is a well I mean be careful on the internet there's always misinformation yeah. and whatever yeah. but we we highly encourage you to explore more about the topic if you're interested because mm -hmm. we only have such limited knowledge ourselves mm -hmm. Uh, we will be putting some links in the description. Mm -hmm. um, again, use those as starting points for what could be a nice little deep dive into this topic. Well, I don't think it would be a nice little deep dive. It would be like a horrific deep dive. Um, but you get what I mean. Mm -hmm. And as always, thank you for tuning in today. We hope you enjoyed this episode. Maybe you learned something. Maybe you have been Alka inspired to learn more, but then I don't like I don't like the fact that I use the word inspired. Okay. <laughs> As always, thank you for tuning in today. Like Rihanna was saying, we hope you learned something. We hope maybe this episode was helpful in any way. And feel free to leave a comment. Did you, ha, have you learned about something like this before? Have you learned about Imperialist Japan? I mean, I, as far as I know, and for the both of us, this was not something we learned about in school. Mm -hmm. So uh, if you learned about it in school, tell us about that. Yeah. Well, what was it like? How does it feel knowing that not everyone learns about it? Yeah. And maybe you have some stories about or from parents, grandparents, relatives. Do you share if you're comfortable and willing? Mm -hmm. And if you're someone that is interested in, maybe you work in it, you currently study it. By it, I mean... History? I was trying to think of something more specific. Like, mm. But yes, his history. If you're, if you're someone that works in and studies this kind of aspect of history or this period of history, let us, let us know. Yeah. Do you have anything you'd like to share while you're here? You're welcome to do that. Yeah. Mm. Well, if you could share some reasons. <laughs> yes. Of course, if you're. If you, guys like this episode and want to stay connected with us check out our website in the description it contains links to our streaming platforms such as spotify anchor apple podcasts and more follow us for more behind the scenes content announcements and other random things we decide to put on there <laughs> <laughs>